All right, James chapter 1 and verse number 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. It's like a man that looked into a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. I don't know about y'all, but when I get up in the morning, I need to look in the mirror. This don't look this good in the morning. It takes a little effort. But if I look in that mirror and I do nothing but walk away, you with me? Verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. We're talking about the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen. I want to preach tonight with your help and with God's man in the mirror. Man in the mirror. Brother Greg, would you be so kind to pray for the word tonight? Amen. We love you tonight, God. We thank you for everything that you've done, God, everything that you're doing. We just desire your will to be done, Lord. Touch each and every heart, God, each and every mind. Let your word soak into our spirits, Lord, and lay on fertile ground and grow and flourish into our lives. Change us tonight. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Sitting down with her today, you will find that she is in her mid-70s. She lives a comfortable life now with grandchildren, with family around. She married well off. But to hear her story would really change how you would look at her. For Marina, at the age between four and five, she grew up in a small village near the jungles of Colombia. One night, while she laid in her little poor shack, someone had grabbed her. A dirty sack was put above her face. She was taken out, kicking and screaming. Rough hands threw her into a bed of a pickup truck. Now, as she recalls these memories, they're broken, they're fragmented, but she's still very sharp in her mind. And she tells the story of how that she could hear the sounds of other children crying, sounds of others moving around as the truck began to race through the jungle, bouncing and moving and rain falling upon them, cold and wet. And, and finally it stopped and rough hands grabbed her again, but this time the one that grabbed her began to throw her over their shoulder and run with her through the jungle. She could feel the smacking of branches and the, the ripping of her clothing and the panting of the breath of this individual. And even in her fear, her petrified horror, she gripped to the, the, the man's clothing not knowing what else to do as he began to run through the forest and Finally, after a while, he dropped her off his shoulders and she lay on the wet jungle floor. And as she laid there to her horror, she heard the sound of receding footsteps as he ran away, leaving her in the jungle. She lay there through the night, afraid to move, trembling in the cold. She began to crawl up into the bush to hide as the sun began to rise, she began to hear noises. And as she looked around, she saw little monkeys. Later on, it was identified to be kombuchin monkeys. And they began to uh, come down to where she was and begin to prod at her and poke at her. She was afraid. She didn't know what to do. They were pulling at her clothes and pulling at her hair and poking at her eyes. And she would try to bat them away. And finally, they got 
where they were not interested in her anymore and they backed away from her and they began to do their own things and she watched as they began to eat and as food began to fall where they were eating she would scurry over and she'd pick up the food and it became a situation of monkey see monkey do and whatever they did she began to do it and she began to follow them around and when they got water she saw where to get water and this went from one day into two days and three days turned into four and four days turned into a week and week turned into a month as she began to be accepted by this group of kombuchan monkeys and she would follow them and when they would be startled she learned how to hide and she learned eventually how to climb up into the trees and even today in her mid 70s it is known that she loves to climb into trees in her 70s she will climb up into trees as her grandchildren and will chase her and they can barely keep up at 75 she can out climb them in the trees but she began to live, but something began to happen as, as the years began to go by, not months, years, as they have interviewed her and studied. They believe it's anywhere from five to ten years that Marina was lost in the jungles of Colombia, lost, afraid, but surviving. It's amazing what the human can go through and still survive. Amen. Amen. And as she was there, she began to lose. She lost her identity. Her normal changed. She began to learn just to survive. She lost her language. She, she forgot what, how to speak her language. The memory of her mother faded away. She couldn't even remember her own mother's name. Her own mind began to slip as she only began to learn the, the, the squeaks and the grunts and the sounds of the kombuchan monkeys. And she began to learn how to survive. And she knew what the sounds meant. And she began to survive. She lost her personality. Could you imagine a five to ten year old that hadn't taken a bath in five to ten years? Come on. No clothing. She said that her hair became her clothing. She learned how to wrap her hair as it grew down around her knees and she would cover herself in the cold and, and, and when it would rain, she would hide and she survived. Her mind was lost. Her identity was lost. But one day while up in the trees, now anywhere from 10 to 15 years old, they're not sure, as she was in the trees after a particular time of hard rain, she saw something on the ground in the distance. It reflected. It was shiny. It caught her attention, and she knew if she didn't get to it, one of the others would get to it first. And so she scurried down the tree, and she went over, and she prodded at it and jumped back and, and, and just acting just like one of the monkeys, a wild animal, if you would. She began to poke at it, and finally she picked it up. It was a piece of a broken mirror. She didn't know what it was. But when she flipped it over, she threw it down, and she ran and hid behind the tree because she didn't recognize what she was seeing. It scared her what she was looking at. But her curiosity got the best of her. So she began to go back and she'd pick it up and she would gasp and look away. And then finally she began to look at it and begin to look closer. And she began to realize the eyes looking back at her were not the eyes of the other monkeys. And the hair and the skin and she, in the, even in the dirt and grime, she began to realize there's something different. And it was in that moment, she said, that was the moment everything changed. A longing got inside of her. I don't belong here. I, and she began to look and she began to search and, and sure enough, it wasn't too long. The sounds that used to make all the other monkeys run away, the, the sounds of humanity, she began to stop as they run away and she began to listen and she began to be drawn to those things. And before long, she came in contact with others and they rescued her from the jungle. 
And ironically, her name today is Marina Chapman, and she lives in England. I don't know any relation to myself, but this is a true story. But I share this story with you tonight, this Friday night of this tent revival, because I believe you too have been lost in the jungle of life. I believe in every single one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, somewhere out there, we've got lost in sin. We got lost and we begin to hang out with those uh, that we felt like they were a part of us, but it was really just an act uh, of survival. But somewhere, somehow, we got exposed uh, to a mirror. We got exposed uh, to a sermon. We got, hey, maybe the first time you heard preaching, maybe you ran away and said, I ain't never going back to that church. Uh, I don't like the way that pastor preaches. But there's something down deep inside of you that brought you back on a Friday night that says I need more of that mirror because I realize when I see that, I see who I am supposed to be. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. The more Holy Ghost apostolic holiness preaching you get, that's more of the mirror that's opened up to your soul. And the more you get it, the more you realize, I am not of this world. I was not made for this world. I don't fit into this world. I was made for something greater. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, somebody say praise the Lord. Lord. A mirror. A mirror reflects what is placed before it. We live in a generation that wants to twist the mirror. You with me? They want to twist this thing to fit what they want to live. They want to find them a church and find them a preacher. The Bible says to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Just tickle my ears, preacher. Just twist that Bible to make me feel good. I don't like the way that old time preacher preaches because when he shines the mirror, it scares me. When I see when he preaches, I'm afraid of what I see. When I hear that old preacher preaching, I hear that old time preaching, it makes me afraid. I come to tell you, you ain't got to be afraid of this thing. Just stay in the mirror. Just look in the mirror. Let the mirror reveal what's there. And when you're done don't leave the same way you came somebody shout hallelujah this bible this bible is a mirror it reveals who we really ought to be it reveals how we really ought to dress it reveals how we really ought to talk it reveals, uh, come on, uh, I may have not had the right language out there, but when I came in here, I got taught how I'm supposed to talk. Uh, I got taught how I'm supposed to live. Uh, I got taught how I'm supposed to dress. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's preached word, and then there's read word. We need to hear preaching and we need to read it. Somebody say amen. amen. What the Bible says, the man that hears the word but does not obey the word deceives himself. You're not deceiving anybody else. You're lying to yourself. Huh? Pastor is not helping me. The church doesn't like me. They are talking about me. No, you're deceiving yourself. Ain't nobody talking about you. Pastor likes you. He's not judging you. He's just loving you. Oh, yeah, I feel the Holy Ghost in this tent tonight. I don't know who God's trying to reach tonight, but I just feel like God's trying to reach us someone that you've been trying to hide yourself away from the mirror. You've been trying to avoid some things in your life, but God's saying, no, 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 get back to the mirror. You need to yearn for somebody to clean that mirror up and say, look, 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 they need to get back into this. Look in this word. Come on, pastor, preach to me. Come on, preacher, preach to me. Somebody clap your hands to God. <laughs> Problem with so many. We live in a generation that loves preaching. I'm, not, I'm talking about the church, the apostolic movement. They love preaching. We've got apps for preaching. We've got apostolic vault, apostolic uh, radio, Holy Ghost radio. So many other avenues to get preaching. We have a generation that are conference junkies. And come on. 
They go from conference to conference and preaching to preaching and service to service. But if you don't change, what good is it? If you don't change, what good is it? Amen. If all you do is hear, if all you do is take in, but you don't put out, you become a dead sea. The Dead Sea in the Middle East is the Dead Sea for one fact. Not because it doesn't take water in. It's a Dead Sea because it doesn't put water out. It takes water in, but it has nothing going out. And if all you do is take in and you don't put out, you're going to become a Dead Sea. God made us to put out. God made us to change. God made us to get better. Come on. My God, my God. Praise God, praise God. Amen. Amen. I thank God for apostolic preaching. I, 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 I've been in this my whole life, 40 years. This is all I've known. But still yet, I yearn to be challenged. My wife and I boarded a plane just on Monday, went to Louisiana, and I told Brother Spells to preach to me on Monday night at his house. And then Tuesday night, man, I want you to preach to me, challenge me. Why? Because I want to be challenged. Because I always want to change. I want you to know as long as you live, you always have room to grow. Amen. I said as long as you live, you always have room to grow. Amen. I like what the elder said when I was younger. He said, if you get too old to learn, you're too dumb to live. Uh huh. I said, if you get too old to learn, you're too dumb to live. There's never a point in your life on this earth that you don't need preaching. There's never a point in your life on this earth that you don't need to be challenged by the mirror. Come on. You may have everything right, but I'm telling you, there's sometimes attitudes get on you. And you just need a preacher to preach at you. You may have it all right on the outside, but every once in a while the attitude gets wrong on the inside. And you need a preacher to preach to you. Get the mirror back out. Challenge me. Now I know. Read my rag. I'm sweating I know, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you folks who came out on a Friday night because you want to be preached to. But just would you just preach to me anyways? Would you just indulge me? Because I know God's trying to challenge somebody tonight. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's a law. There are many laws. Laws of nature. Amen. There's a law of gravity. I don't care how much you think you can float. You jump off Table Rock Mountain. Huh? Without a parachute, there's a law. What's that law say? That which goes up is coming down. Let me, let me say this. This always gets me. I, somebody, I'm preaching. I was preaching last night. And somebody said, well, I just don't believe it. They didn't tell me that. I felt that. I just don't believe what that church believes. I just, let me tell you, your lack of faith doesn't change law. Just because you don't believe in gravity doesn't mean you're going to start floating around this tent. Huh? Your lack of belief doesn't change the fact of what's truth. Somebody say amen. Woo, glory. It's a law. There's a law of the flow. Everybody say flow. Years ago, in the little building we were in downtown, 15 years ago, it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it's been 15 years a little building on Patterson Street that we had church in. Went down there and we began to bring all our PA equipment. If you know anything about us, we like being loud. We like being loud. And so we started putting our PA equipment in and we started putting our drums in and our keyboards in. And all of a sudden, stuff started acting up. Right in the middle of service, it would just cut off. It would start flickering the lights. And it just so happened, Brother Patterson was up one weekend. He's an electrician. I said, Brother Patterson, I got a problem. My PA's messing up. It's good stuff. I've had it checked, but what's wrong with this stuff? He went again to look at the building. He looked outside, looked inside. He said, your problem is the law of the flow. He pointed out that transformer outside. He said, right out there is enough power to run a hundred of these churches. And there ain't nothing wrong with your equipment. He said, the problem is you got 1948 wiring between that transformer and your equipment. It's the law of the flow. You got a lot of power out here, but it's getting jammed up right here for it to be able to use what's over there. Well, that spoke to me in more than one way. 
See, a lot of you are wondering, why doesn't God use me? Why doesn't God bless me? Why can't I feel the Holy Ghost like I want to? Why do I struggle so? It's the law of the flow. There ain't nothing wrong with God. There ain't nothing wrong with your calling. There's something wrong with what you're giving out. There's something you're holding on to that's clogging up the flow. Come on. The question is, are you going to be honest enough to realize, uh, hey, there's things I need to let go of. There's friends I need to let go of. There's, uh, there's some styles I need to let go of. There's some music I need to, I'm going to tell you what will happen when you begin to let go of things and stuff begins to flow. You'll find out how much power God has. And you'll find out there ain't nothing wrong with your calling. There ain't nothing wrong with you. It was the flow. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You start letting the flow go. As things begin to happen. You start repenting. You start shedding some, shedding some dead weight. Lay aside every and. Come on. I know I, I get people saying, oh, pastor, oh, pastor. Is it really a heaven or hell issue? Is that really a sin? It, no, 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 it may not be a sin. But not everything is sin. There are some things that are weights. You want to know why you don't feel God? You want to know why you don't feel joy? And why you got anxiety building up? And why you got depression building up? Because, because of the flow. Well, just tell me what it is. See, the problem is you already know what it is. You're lying to yourself. You already know what you need to get rid of. You don't need me to tell you. You don't need Pastor Moore to tell you. You need to go back in there and clean up the mirror and, and, and stop running away from what God's been dealing with you about uh, and stop running away with what you know you need to do better in your walk with God. I'm talking about a law of the flow. What would happen if all, I don't know how many are here tonight, 150 people are here tonight, whatever it is, what would happen if the 100 of us uh, would make up our mind? Uh, I'm not going to let anything uh, stop what God trying to do. I'm not going to let anything stop what God's trying to accomplish. I tell you there's untapped potential in here. There's untapped potential in here. I used to get so frustrated with our speakers. There wasn't nothing wrong with the speaker. There was something wrong with the flow. I used to get frustrated with the microphone. There wasn't nothing wrong with the microphone. There was something wrong with the flow. The devil's trying to convince you there's something wrong with you. The devil's trying to convince you it's because, it's because of your lineage. It's because you don't, you don't have that apostolic lineage. It's because you're first generation. It's because, well, you know, well, you know, yeah. The devil will tell you it's because of all the bad things you've done. I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nothing you've done that's bigger than the blood of Jesus. Come on. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God wants to cover it with the blood. God wants you to let go of it. His power is unlimited. His potential is unlimited. And let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, what you have to offer God, you haven't even scratched the surface yet. You haven't even scratched the surface to what you can do. But somewhere in the middle, we got to get rid of some stuff. We got to get rid of some attitudes. We got to let go. The Greek word for deception, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it simply means incorrect reasoning, deception, skewed perception. You're not seeing things right. You're not, you're, 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 your perception's wrong. You're not seeing yourself right. You're not seeing the pastor right. You're not seeing the church right. It's deception. It comes from the father of lies. He's the master liar. He's the master distractor. He knows how to get you to see skewed vision. I've seen people come to the same service and one walk out. That was the greatest service I've ever been to. And the one right beside them, I didn't get nothing from that service. Was it the service? No, it was the flow. Because what's happening here tonight 
is God is about to pour out something in this tent. Come on. There's not a lot of places across this land that people are having church right now. I would, I, would, I would be willing to say across the entire state right now, how many of you think are in service at this very moment? How many churches? How many tent revivals? How many? We may be the only one. This may be the only place. And then if you went in further, Virginia, God help us if we lived in Virginia. Or South Carolina, Tennessee. I just wonder if we went through the whole entire southeast of the country, how many are in church tonight? We may very well be the only place in the entire country right now that's having church tonight. You may very well be some of the few that have came. Do you believe we have God's undivided attention? I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel like God has stepped out on the edge of heaven. And he has got a barrel full. It's been building up for the last 60 days. There's conferences that had to cancel. There's camp meetings and youth conventions that's canceled. But all of a sudden, there's a group of people that gather together on a hillside in western North Carolina. And God wants to pour out something in this tent. What are you doing, preacher? I'm trying to get you ready to receive. I'm trying to get you ready. I don't want you to leave this tent tonight and not get something because you're holding on to things you need to let go of. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I feel a trembling in the Holy Ghost tonight. I feel an anointing. I believe God's about to do something. Stay with me. Stay with me. Somebody say praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Deception. It spreads like a cancer. The conscience is slowly seared. But hearing God's word is a salve. It is an ointment to a hurting heart, to a bitter spirit, the preaching of the word. Thank God for singing. Thank God for music. But music's not what's going to get you there. We're never going to sing the best. We're never going to sing your favorite song. It just ain't going to work. You got to get your own song in your heart. But God chose by the foolishness of preaching. He chose the preaching to begin. You see, what's happening is while I've been preaching, God's already been knocking on the doors of your heart. He's already been saying, come on, you know what you've been holding on to. You know that friendship, you just got to let it go. You know you know, you got to let it go. Your potential is so great. But if you don't let go, it's not going to be God's fault. It's not going to be your calling's fault. It's going to be your fault because you stopped the flow. The other problem is not just those that don't do, but it's those who forget. The Bible says, verse 23, that he that looked in the mirror, but immediately forgets what manner of man he was. God help us tonight. That as the preacher preaches and the mirror has been cleaned in front of us, that as God begins to dwell into your heart and begin to speak into your mind, that you will not just walk away and before you get into your car, forget what manner of man or woman you are. First John 3.10 says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. When we walk out of here tonight, it'll be manifest. The children of God and the children of the devil. You're either one or the other. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. Come on, Holy Ghost. You don't get to be in the middle. You can't serve two masters. You either love one and hate the other. 
Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Can we just begin to pray right now? I feel, I feel an attack. Come on, can have some saints of God just begin to pray. I, I am not here to entertain you tonight. I, I, I'm getting too old for entertainment. Oh, God. How long are you going to be satisfied living in the coldness, in the darkness? Come on, can we just begin to pray? Can we begin to open our hearts to what God is doing in this place tonight? There's people here that need to repent. There's people here that need the Holy Ghost. You've never spoken in tongues, and you need to find that mispa in your life. Luke 6, 46 says, And why call ye me Lord? Lord, and do not the things which I say. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show to you whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the, and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great when you leave a service like this and you don't obey and you don't repent you're building a house on shifting sand come on don't get mad when everything begins to fall apart in your in your life don't blame the preacher don't blame god it's the foundation you chose to build on which is the problem somebody say amen Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Praise God. I'm almost getting ready to close. I'm about to close this out. God's been speaking to someone. Perception is an issue in this generation. How we see each other is an issue. But more importantly, is how you see yourself. There are three, if you would, there are three views tonight. There is the way you see yourself. There is the way others see you. And third and most important, there is the way God sees you. I have been preaching here in the local church on the spirit of insecurity and inferiority that's been attacking our churches. It is not from God. It is not from God. It is a lie. It is a trick. Because when you start feeling insecure and inferior, the devil knows once you start having that insecurity, it stops the flow. Because when you're insecure, you don't walk in boldness. He knows when you're insecure, you're not going to walk in the grocery store and lay hands on somebody and pray for them. So, what's insecurity? It's your worrying about how others see you. You're worrying about. And it's also a skewed way you see yourself. I'm just not good enough. If I was Sister Chapman or if I was Brother Chapman, I could be a better, I could do better. No, no, no. no. Be careful. The Bible says to compare ourselves among ourselves is foolish. You don't know what each person is carrying. But I was there. I was a young man that the flow was not there because I was insecure. But somewhere at a North Carolina youth camp, I carried that insecurity. And I laid on the altar and I looked back in the mirror and I began to see what manner of man I was. I, I, I'm not trying. Come on. You see, we are so caught up on beating each other down. It's almost impossible for us to build each other up. 
I'm going to tell you something. You know why we, why we don't build each other up? It's because we see a few that get lifted up with pride and they think they're better than everybody else. But I'm going to tell you, for everyone that gets lifted up with pride and gets lifted up with the haughtiness, there are ten others dying of discouragement. It's time some of you look in the mirror and see who God made you to be. You, you're, you're, the devil can't have it both ways, Brother Austin. Brother Jesse, the devil can't have it both ways. Barry, he can't have it both ways. The devil's trying to convince some of you you're a nothing, you're a nobody. God's never going to use you. You're never going to have revival. Nothing's ever going to happen for you or your church or your family. He's constantly bombarding you and speaking his lies into your mind. But he can't have it both ways. Because if you're a nothing, if you're a nobody, then why is he sending all of hell against you? Why is he fighting you so hard? Why is he coming after you so hard? Because the devil knows if you ever look in that mirror and you see what manner of man God wants you to be, what manner of young lady God created you to be, Don, if you ever could just look in the mirror like your mom and I do, if you could ever see. See, I can't make you see for it. As much as I'd love for every one of my kids, I'd love to shove that mirror in their face, but it doesn't work. They've got to go to an altar for themselves. And they've got to open that flow up and begin to look. You know what? I said it last night. There's missionaries under this tent. There's going to be preachers come out from under this tent. There's going to be pastors come out from under this tent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why don't we stand? I believe tonight that God wants to perform a miracle. This is not going to be a miracle of physical healing, but I believe tonight that God wants to perform a miracle of mental healing. You say, Pastor Chapman, you're crazy. I ain't crazy. I'm speaking the word of God that God wants to get in somebody's mind. You have stopped the flow and you can't even see the mirror anymore. The image you're looking at is not the image that God had for you. It's not the purpose that God had for you. You've allowed other things to get between what God is trying to do. And I wonder tonight, as we get ready to sing, I wonder tonight if you could be honest with God because laid in this altar up here are little broken mirrors. But I believe if you'll just come and really sincerely repent and pray that you'll maybe all you'll get is a glimpse maybe all you'll just get is a small glimpse but I believe that God will show you something about who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing come on as we begin to pray as we begin to sing I'm